Okay, this is the Civil Rights Movement Part 3, 1963 to 1968. So uh, the first thing that we're going to learn about is SELC, and this should be a review from Civil Rights Part 2 lecture, as well as Civil Rights Part 1. And SELC is a Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This is an organization that is headed up by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It started in the South, uh, really after the Montgomery bus boycott, and spread throughout the nation, but again, really focused on the South and really focused on church participation. Nonviolence is their key, and this is going to be really important for this lecture because the movement is going to start to change just a little bit. We're going to move on and also talk about CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and CORE has been around for a while now. We also mentioned it in the previous lecture during the Freedom Rides. They participated there, and the Congress of Racial Equality is going to have some activism in this uh, presentation as well in this period 1963 to 1968 and just like Christian Leadership Conference they are organized and they're peaceful and they have demonstrations the only real difference is they're not regionally focused in the south and they're not a faith-based uh, activist organization now SNCC this is also an organization that we uh, talked about in previous lessons and lectures, and SNCC is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and SNCC is going to change a lot in this presentation. Remember, they really got kickstarted with this leader, Ella Baker, uh, in 1960, a youth organization with college students and uh, newly graduated college students, these young activists going grassroots, door to door, helping people out, teaching people how to participate in the Freedom Rides. And then in this unit, they're going to focus on voter participation. And then later, SNCC is actually going to take out this part, the nonviolence. They're going to take that part out of their organization and be the Student National Coordinating Committee. And we'll talk about why that happens by the end of the presentation today. So let's clear these drawings and talk about Malcolm X. Now, uh, Malcolm X was a uh, individual who was born in Michigan. He grew up Malcolm Little and eventually he changes his name to X because he feels that Little is his slave name. He's not aware of what his real name is because of his ancestors being transported from slavery. And Malcolm X has a very rough upbringing. His dad advocated black nationalism. He was outspoken about black pride and civil rights. Uh, when he was young, and he was brutally murdered by a white supremacist. And this really affected Malcolm, young Malcolm, because the Justice Department refused to prosecute the white supremacist that, that uh, murdered Malcolm X's dad. And so he grew up with this resentment and this anger. By age 21, he was sent to prison for burglary, and in prison he learned about an important individual that is going to really impact him, Elijah Muhammad. And in prison, he learns about Elijah Muhammad's teaching and then joins uh, the Nation of Islam. And this is going to shape his activism. The Nation of Islam is a black nationalist organization that at this time is preaching rape, uh, racial separatism. And essentially what that means is SNCC at this time has a black hand and a white hand shaking and they're nonviolent. And Southern Christian Leadership Conference is all about turning the other cheek and not being nonviolent. Uh, at this time, the Nation of Islam is saying that racism exists, racism will never go away. And so it's better just to separate and black people can live their own prosperous lives and white people can live their own prosperous lives and there doesn't need to be any mixing. Now, after a stint in prison, X advocated self-defense and liberation of African-Americans by any means necessary. And this is gonna be key. So King has this turn the other cheek and Malcolm X says, if you get punched in the face, you have to defend yourself. However, Malcolm X changes. He goes on a pilgrimage to Mecca as part of his uh, Muslim faith. And there, he really has this awakening about racism and decides to form 
the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And there he's focusing on racism instead of racial separation. So instead of saying white people are to blame for all of the problems of black individuals, let's separate, he says, why don't we attack racism and not the people? So he kind of has a little bit of a, uh, a change. This, unfortunately, has led to his assassination. Uh, February 21st, 1965, he's 39 years old and he is delivering a speech. And in the middle of delivering this speech, three members of the Nation of Islam um, murder him. This is something that really devastates the movement. Uh, by 1965, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are starting to work together. They're still debating, of course, as far as tactics and how to go along with the movement, but they're starting to bridge two sides of the movement together by 1965. However, once X is assassinated and we have a series of violent incidences, uh, particularly the Selma campaign that we'll talk about soon, you're going to start to see the movement splinter further with uh, nonviolence on one side led by King, and then a lot more aggressive tactics led by SNCC on the other. So that's where we are going to move forward now. So with this fight to gain equal rights really begins this fight for political rights. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was prompted after the 16th Street Baptist Church bombings, oh, sorry, not the 16th Street Baptist Church bombings, the uh, Birmingham campaign in Birmingham in the summer of 1963 with the police dogs and the fire hoses, uh, and then Kennedy's assassination in November really ended that. Okay. The fight to gain political rights was incredibly important after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 banned racial discrimination in facilities and businesses that serve the general public. Remember the sit-in movement that SNCC really launched and was super successful at in 1960. So Civil Rights Act of 1964 took care of that problem. Wonderful. In addition to that, it banned any type of discrimination in restaurants, hotels, um, theaters, entertainment venues, really, again, anything for the general public. However, the act failed to address serious issues with protecting African Americans and their voting rights. And this was a massive failure for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So this new focus as we move forward past 1963 is going to be how to gain political rights. So this is going to start uh, with the uh, passage of the 24th Amendment. This happens early in 1964 and it outlaws poll taxes when it comes to federal elections. Now, poll taxes had been in existence since the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed black men the right to vote. And a poll tax could be $1.50, it could be $2.50, it could be 50 cents. It really depended on your state, and it also depended on the type of election. If it was a big federal election like the president, it might be more expensive. Now, here's the real horrible thing about poll taxes. Let's say that you wanna vote in the 2020 election because you really care about the candidates. You'd have to pay your poll tax of $1.50. Now, if you're 65 years old and you had never voted in any election prior to that point, you had to pay all of your back poll taxes. So you would have to pay taxes for the midterm elections in 2018, and then the presidential in 2016, and then any other type of election before that. So you could see it'd be very, very costly, and it would really add up to pay your poll taxes. So the 24th Amendment is a really positive step forward. However, Southern states still use different tactics to prevent African Americans from registering to vote. Some of these would be a collection of poll taxes in state and local elections. Sometimes it was just downright intimidation. I'm gonna fire you if you try to vote. I'm gonna fire you if you I see you at the register office and you're trying to vote. So let's get some historical context here. 
So uh, the woman in the background is Fanny Lou Hamer, and we'll talk about her. This is a, a document really illustrating why voting and having a national campaign protecting voting rights is very important. Fanny Lou Hamer was fired because her boss was informed that she attempted to register to vote. Now, in this document, it outlines several things specifically about how water was cut off from a church because it was a meeting place to teach African Americans how to register to vote, and all of these different types of intimidation that was used specifically in Ruville in Mississippi. Once SNCC becomes aware of these issues, uh, they start to launch a voting campaign. And you can see that here in my analysis of why this is really important. African Americans were prevented from registering to vote. And as it says in the document, if Negroes were permitted to vote in large numbers in Ruleville, they could begin to deal with police brutality, unemployment, injustice in the courts, unequal educational opportunities, and very low wages. So a lot of these issues that are happening in the South, they cannot address because of the laws, because of the judges that are appointed, because of the, the sheriff, which is again an elected position. Position. If you don't have a wide variety of people represented in the franchise and able to vote, then it's really easy to oppress a group of people. So let's clear those drawings. And then really look at some of this context here when it comes to this analysis. So if Fannie Lou Hamer and SNCC is going to make this argument that uh, if Negroes were permitted to vote in large numbers, they could begin to deal with police brutality, unemployment, injustice in the courts, unequal education opportunities, and low wages. We have to look at some data to see if that claim is true. Is there real, real inequity in the South that is going to constantly continue? Because a lot of Southerners said that there was no inequity, that there was no racism. So let's look at this table. Uh, from the Mississippi State Board of Health that examines the death rates by color in these selected years. So if you look, here's the non-white per 1,000 people and here's the white. And the death rates basically is how many people per 1,000 die. And you can see starting in 1920, the death rates are about 9.3% and 15.1% respectively. So again, this is incredibly high. As we move forward to 1961, the death rate is 8.8, .8, so it shrinks for the white individuals, and it also shrinks for the non-white, but look, you're looking at uh, it be incredibly high still across the board every single year when compared to the white population. So you have people of color are dying in higher numbers. Why? It could be because of low wages that are paid that prevents them from going to the doctor. It could be because of unequal education opportunities that prevent them from becoming doctors and working in the Jim Crow South with uh, black individuals having to go to black doctors. Um, it could be injustice in the courts. Uh, there could be a wide variety of reasons. So it is 100% clear that based on this chart, uh, non-white people die at a higher rate than white individuals. So then let's look at and assess this claim with a different piece of, of data. So deaths under one year. So now we're looking at infant mortality. Again, white population starting in 1920, you're looking at 60 babies die per 1,000. Now, non-white population, 101.1. So this is incredibly high. It is almost double the white population. Now, again, let's go up to 1961 in the modern era. And again, this is pretty good because it's cut in half, but it is more than double the white population. 50 babies per 1,000 die. So again, just like the other table with the death rate being higher for non-white individuals, the infant mortality rate is also high. And there's definitely a clear problem that needs to be addressed with this. So lastly, let's assess this claim again by looking at um, the years of school completed by persons 25 and older in 1960. We could scan to the bottom and see the medium grade here completed for non-white is sixth grade and for white it is 11th grade. And you could look at how all of this data is compiled here. So definitely unequal educational opportunities. You can ask yourself why. Uh, again, you're probably because of unemployment. If parents aren't 
getting high wages or if they're unemployed, their children might have to quit school and go to work. You could also look at the history of sharecropping. So uh, in order to address these issues, it is SNCC's idea that to increase voter participation. And they do that by launching a campaign called Freedom Summer. And they do this in the summer of 1964. And this is really important because when the Civil Rights Act of 64 is passed, a lot of people quickly realize that voting was left out. Uh, and many African Americans in Southern states could not register. Uh, they have poll taxes in state and local elections and they have literacy tests. And these literacy tests were incredibly ridiculous. You would have to name um, all of the state and local officials. You would have to list some uh, federal officials. You would get a line in the constitution and say, what article, section, and clause does this line belong in? Now, let's say that you are smart as a whip and you've taken this 25 times. You're a third grade marshal and you studied the constitution in the basement of your elementary school growing up. Uh, then they would say, how many bubbles are in this bar of soap? How many seeds are in this slice of watermelon? How many strands of hair do I have on my head? How many balls of cotton did it take to make my shirt? Basically, these literacy tests were any means necessary to prevent African Americans from registering to vote uh, by any means necessary. And again, as you saw in the case with Fannie Lou Hamer beforehand, she was fired from her job because the county registrar notified her boss that she was attempting to register to vote. So you have literacy tests, you have poll taxes, uh, and you just have straight up intimidation preventing people from voting. Because if they vote, they can make change. So during Freedom Summer in Mississippi in 1964, um, there were no African Americans registered to vote in five whole counties that had African American majorities. Now, of course, a lot of Southerners said, oh, well, that's because they have no interest in voting. Uh, of course, that was not the case, especially when you're looking at the prior data that I just showed you. This is when SNCC and CORE are going to work together to launch Freedom Summer. And what they're going to do is form the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party as an alternative to the all-white Democratic Party. And then they're either going to go down south and launch a voter registration campaign to get as many people to register to vote as possible. And then at the end of the summer, since it's an election year, they're going to go up to the Democratic uh, National Convention and they're going to demand to be seated as delegates from Mississippi. So let's see how this goes. You have Dr. King and he is going door to door, registering people to vote. He is a member of SCLC, but this was a campaign that was really widespread, despite the fact that it was mainly organized by SNCC and CORE. You start to see participating in the 1964 Democratic Convention. Students in Ohio are joining hands prior to living, leaving for Mississippi to participate in the Freedom Summer. And again, something I just wanna point out because this is going to change dramatically. You have white and you have black participants. You have male, you have female. A lot of these individuals are young. This is going to change uh, in the coming years. Uh, you also have peaceful demonstrations throughout Mississippi. You have, as you can see here, a member of the clergy uh, and they're marching and they're holding signs. So they're incredibly peaceful. Again, the movement is going to start to change pretty soon. And then in this last image, you see a, a picture of an individual really teaching these people how to register to vote. It's easy now. We could do this in numbers. We are not going to be intimidated. However, this was quite dangerous. There was a lot of opposition that was met. As you can see here, very straight face, more than 300,000 Negroes are denied the vote in Alabama. Uh, people in NAACP trying to participate in this movement, really wanting to have peace. Uh, however, you you have protests, you have people that go out in the streets and sometimes themselves peacefully say, no, we're holding the Confederate flag and we're against you. Sometimes it was just downright violent. And we'll talk about that here. This was an incredibly dangerous mission. 
In June of 1964, in this freedom campaign, three volunteers disappeared um, in Mississippi. And you can see their images here. And they disappeared. And just giving you some historical context, at this time, KKK membership increased to 10,000 in Mississippi alone. Uh, the KKK also had 61 cross burnings and staged 20 burnings in black churches. Now, when all of this is happening, the police aren't doing much. Um, the federal government, uh, led by Kennedy and then later Johnson, tries to investigate this, but the state and state officials are not working with the FBI at this time. Now, when these three workers go missing, that is when the, oh, let me go back here. There we go. That is when the FBI is going to get more involved in this. At this time, Johnson and King are working uh, pretty closely together. So what happened with these individuals? They were driving um, home and they were driving in a known core car, remember Congress of Racial Equality, that was known to the police. And they're pulled over and they're arrested. And when they're arrested for some minor alleged traffic violation, they are put in jail and they're not released. Now, um, their bail is eventually paid and they're eventually free. But when they're free and they leave, uh, they're never to be seen from again. Uh, eventually, uh, members of CORE notice that those three are not back by the, in the middle of the night. The car is missing, they are missing. And because this had been a dangerous time just a year prior, remember, um, Medgar Evers was assassinated from the NAACP in, in front of his house when he got off of work. So violence is something that is to be expected. So members of CORE call the police and say that these three individuals are missing. Now, uh, eventually, federal agents are called in and more than 200 federal agents come in and they search for these individuals and eventually their remains are found. It is discovered that um, six known KKK members and a jailer were found guilty and served less than six years in prison. So eventually um, the remains are found and recovered and people do go to jail for this, but it, it was a hard fight. There was a lot of pushback from the state of Mississippi. Uh, King turns this into a, a national issue. He goes on television. Uh, and again, here you see SNCC and CORE and SELC working together. The first thing that is discovered is their vehicle is found um, and it's found torched. Later, federal troops lead the search for these individuals. And there um, not only are the three bodies found, but also so are the remains of eight other individuals who were missing, who were thought to have been killed from the KKK and a hate crime. So this is something that really draws attention to the violence that is being inflicted upon these nonviolent activists. And eventually SNCC is going to get very frustrated with this violence inflicted upon them, and they are going to start to change their tactics. King uh, says, uh, it will take 103 years to register all of the 15,000 Negroes in Dallas County who are qualified to vote. Today marks the beginning of a determined, organized, mobilized campaign to get the right to vote everywhere in Alabama. Give us the ballot. We will seek to arouse the federal government by marching by the thousands. We must be willing to go to jail by the thousands. We are not asking, we are demanding for the ballot. So this Freedom Summer and the deaths of these core workers really illustrate how hard it is to fight to get the right, the right to vote. The 15th Amendment and the uh, 19th Amendment had guaranteed men and women the right to vote. However, it's not being enforced and people are willing to kill to prevent um, African Americans from voting in the South. Basically, there is a lot more work to be done to ensure voting rights. And this is what leads us to the Selma campaign. Now in the Selma campaign, um, Selma is chosen for this movement because only 3% of African Americans were registered to vote in Selma, despite the fact that, again, they are the majority of the population. So at this time, SNCC 
organizes 600 peaceful marchers with the intent to march 54 miles to Montgomery, the capital. Now, this becomes a little bit of a struggle um, for SNCC. John Lewis is the head of SNCC at this moment. Uh, we mentioned John Lewis in the Freedom Rides and the uh, March on Washington during the Civil Rights Part Two lecture. So uh, the, these 600 marchers, they start at this church and they need to just walk a few, a few blocks across this bridge to exit Selma. And this bridge is the Edmund Pettus Bridge out of Selma. And while there on the other side of the bridge are these state troopers. And the troopers gave the protesters two minutes to return home, said, go away and there will not be a problem. However, John Lewis and SNCC were determined to draw attention to the need to bring fair voting uh, participation and voter registration to Selma, and they were going to march to the Capitol to make sure that every policymaker in Alabama knew this was a problem. However, in less than two minutes, the troops stormed the protesters with clubs, horses, and tear gas. 50 protesters were treated at the hospital, and this is known as Bloody Sunday. So here uh, we have uh, the start of the march um, at the church with 600 marchers organized. And you can see on this red path that they were gonna take. So here's the Edmund Pettus Bridge right here. Um, and here is the site of Bloody Sunday. Uh, if you go and visit Selma now, this is the site of the um, National Park Service uh, Selma Museum. So here you see um, in this middle image, uh, John Lewis right here, he has his hands in his pocket. And this is incredibly significant because the whole time throughout this march, he has his hands in his pocket, uh, indicating that he is nonviolent. And if you even look at this straight line here, they're walking on the side. They're being very careful not to disrupt traffic. Uh, they do not want to end the march for any reason. They don't want the police or the government to say, oh, you're trying to disrupt traffic, or you're trying to disrupt business, or you're trying to get violent. They would say, nope. We are along the curb of the street, our hands in our, are in our pockets, and just notice how they're dressed, right? They're wearing ties, they're wearing nice shoes, uh, they are looking very serious, definitely wanting to make sure that everyone knows that they are going to embark upon a peaceful demonstration. However, right when they cross the bridge, and you can see this here, um, they are attacked by the police. Clear this. First, you have the march uh, on this picture over here. You can see the warning that the state troopers give SNCC and John Lewis. Again, look at them lined up. Look at the hands in the pockets. Uh, and they're at a, a strong distance here. These marchers are not moving forward, but you can see the state troops are moving forward. And then they storm the protesters. You see in these images, the state troopers are moving forward, just like you saw in this image. And you can see the clubs. And you can see John Lewis has his hands behind his head, really indicating, I am not violent. I am not hitting back. Now, obviously, we have evidence of this because we're looking at pictures here. But these images were incredibly powerful because they're on the news and spread rapidly for people to see and say, yes, we have a problem. This is something that needs to be addressed. This, however, frustrated a lot of members of SNCC and a lot of civil rights activists who saw the police just embarking on just downright aggressive violence. Uh, they have tear masks to begin with. You know, they're on mounted horses and you can see that uh, they are progressing forward. There's the tear gas. We can look at a little bit of this video.
cross over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Diane and I went to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. There, where I turned around and left Cheyenne. <laughs> so because I'm telling you, I, I was afraid. Waiting on the other side were Alabama state troopers under orders from Governor Wallace to stop the marchers. Okay, let's skip that question. Clark's posse was on the sideline. Detrimental to your safety to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful assembly. You have to disperse. Your orders to disperse. Go home or go to your church. This march will not continue. Is that clear to you? I've got nothing further to say to you. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. When this happens, the, the marchers return back to their church or they're pushed back to their church, uh, but SNCC does not give up. Um, SCLC and King join in on this march and they start to negotiate with President Johnson. Two days after the first, mar first march, King jumps in and he and John Lewis lead this march they go to the bridge and then they turn around. This is known as Turn Around Tuesday. Now, in the meantime, King and President Johnson are meeting back and forth and they're talking on the phone about how to uh, successfully have this march. However, the state of Alabama is pushing back against President Johnson, SNCC, and SCLC. Um, and it's not until the state courts and then the federal courts and then eventually Johnson weighs in saying that this march is legal and it is authorized. That is when we have a third and final march. So two weeks after the first march, a federal judge authorizes this march to Montgomery. And you can see here, very similar to the other picture. They are very uniform, walking in a straight line. They're walking along the side of the road, careful not to disrupt traffic. Now this road is a very rural country road. So it would be very easy to get hit by a car. And it's incredibly dangerous for all of these individuals to be marching specifically because of how violent people are against um, this movement at this time. But you can see on this image here, it's very integrated and they're really patriotic. They're really trying to prove to America that they are doing the patriotic thing by advocating uh, the right to vote. So just some facts for you. Sunday, March 21st, 3,200 marchers started from Selma. Marchers marched 12 miles a day. They slept in fields. Uh, they basically only had what they carried on their backs. So uh, we started with 3,200 marchers. And then by Thursday, March 25th, we have 25,000 marchers arriving in Montgomery. And shortly thereafter, by August 6th, 1965, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into law that bans literacy tests and outlaws poll taxes in all elections. So let's look at this photo as they enter in the Capitol. Uh, as far as what the marchers are saying, to me it looks like they're all singing because they're all basically speaking at the same exact time. 
Now, symbols that I see in the picture, I could get that back up. Symbols that I see in the in the picture, you can look in the background. We have American flags here all over the place and they're waving them. In addition, it's important to look at how they're all dressed. We have dresses, we have skirts, we have suits, we have ties. Everything looks clean, everything looks pressed. And that's really important to show that, that they're there not to be violent, they're there not to be a fight, but they're incredibly professional. Now, who's marching? Hopefully you can look at this picture and see that we have young, and we have older, and we have white, and we have black. So this is a very diverse group of people. And do you think this photo is on day one, two, three, or the last day of the march? Like I mentioned, um, it might look like it's the beginning or the end because they don't look like they've been marching for four straight days. They don't look like they have been sleeping in tents alongside of the the highway um, but this is the end uh, going to the capital and they are you know ready to draw attention to their need uh, to have voting rights so uh, let's look at some data again and see if african americans were fairly participating in the franchise or in elections in 1964 you could see in alabama um, overall as a state not just a county you have a little over 20 percent in mississippi you have less than 10 percent participating by 1968 you can see that across the board all of the numbers are doubling or not doubling all the numbers are dramatically increasing they're more than doubling in mississippi they're more than doubling it looks like in alabama in several states in texas you have over 75 percent registered to vote now long-term effects of the voting rights you can see here that uh, by 1968, uh, the voting participation, which is the actual participation, is dramatically increasing. Now, it's not as high as other groups, but especially if you look at this one right here, which is Black participation in the North, which had uh, been higher than Black participation in the South, but it's really key here is this skyrocketing right here percentage of African-American voting age population registered. Uh, and you can see before the Voting Rights Act and then after the Voting Rights Act, and this gives you a broader idea of more states um, has increased. After Selma though, the movement changes. It goes on a dramatically different course. Um, so in your thinking question, um, how did Selma or after Selma, how did SNCC change? So this is from a book uh, by historian Todd Gitlin on the 60s years of hope days of rage and he writes SNCC was tilting towards an angry nationalism. The Selma Montgomery March led by King in March of 65 was the high watermark of integrationism. It televised dignity. Think about those suits that they were wearing standing up tall in that line, but it was juxtaposed against this racist violence um, that the police exhibited against them. And this eventually does spur Johnson to declare we shall overcome and push through this Voting Rights Act. But militant members of SNCC felt betrayed by King's decision to draw back from confrontation, to wait until Johnson gave the official go ahead to march again. So SNCC really criticized King for doing that. So, Another problem is we have voting rights with 1965, we have integration and an end of discrimination or a legal end to discrimination, but we, what do we do next? You know, we have riots at this time, we have dramatic economic inequity, we still have social inequity, um, education. So how do you move them, make the movement go forward? And that becomes a a big uh, push on how SNCC is going to change. So uh, Stokely Carmichael is going to be the new leader of SNCC. And as a new leader of SNCC, he is going to change the movement to be black power. So he's elected in 1966 and John Lewis is um, not in SNCC anymore. He's gonna move on um, with a different career. And he's really frustrated because of what I had mentioned before. He had faced arrests, he had uh, participated in um, 
the freedom rides, but he really got frustrated with uh, a new incident with James Meredith. Remember him from um, integrating Old Miss from the previous lecture. Now, James Meredith embarked on a solitary march from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi, about 20 miles, and Meredith was shot and wounded badly. Now, when this happened, this is when SNCC and Stokely Carmichael get incredibly frustrated and upset and say, this is why we need to get rid of this nonviolence. We've been saying freedom for six years, and what we're going to start saying now is black power. So black power, according to Stokely Carmichael, meant a call for black people in this country to unite, to recognize their heritage, to build a sense of community, and it is a call for black people to define their own goals and lead their own organizations. So you're going to start to see this movement change dramatically for SNCC. And I'm going to skip that video. Uh, you can look on the History Channel for it some other time. So the Black Panthers um, and SNCC are kind of going to grow up together um, at this movement. The Black Panthers started in Oakland, California as a Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. There had been a number of Black men who were shot in the back by police officers um, in Oakland uh, at this time. And the police in all of these incidents said I, that they were acting in self-defense. And so the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense started saying, okay, let's carry guns and let's carry them in front of our body so that the police don't accuse us of hiding a gun from them. So uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale started this movement and their main issue was challenging the police brutality against the African-American community. Now, the Black Panthers, it, they're a very interesting, very diverse organization. They have a 10 point, point program that's focused on a lot of economic, social, and political issues. Uh, they want freedom in their black community. They want employment and into robbery by capitalists, by our black and oppressed communities, um, uh, by the capitalists of our black and oppressed communities. So again, you start to see economic issues like housing and employment. They're focused on social issues like teaching African-American history. Uh, the Vietnam War is going on at this time, and so they're turning this into a political issue about the war. Uh, police brutality. Uh, we want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, and county and city prisons. Again, this is a political issue because they feel like a lot of black individuals are convicted without being assessed by a jury of their peers. They want land, bread, housing, education. So they're a multifaceted organization. However, a lot of people see the Black Panthers um, uh, in different lights because they are very, very diverse and complex. So when it comes to the Black Panthers, they did do a ton of community um, engagement. They wanted to increase African-American political engagement by advocating for Black people to get involved in politics and run for office. They provided free breakfast programs for school children. They started health clinics in African-American communities. Uh, they developed African-American history curriculum to include it, be included in school. However, uh, they also have a lot of violence and controversy surrounding them as well. Um, like I had mentioned, a lot of different violent encounters with the police, some of them involving um, dead Black Panthers and some of them involving dead police officers. Uh, you also have violent conflicts among party members. Uh, many of these violent conflicts are over questions on the loyalties to the party. Um, and the FBI ended up declaring the Black Panthers the enemy of the US government and one of the greatest threats to the nation's inter internal security. Uh, and this really shows how this movement is going to be more than just um, ensuring equal political rights. You have this economic and social frustration that is the underbelly of the civil rights movement at this time. And this is typically expressed in riots. So riots occurred, as you can see on this map here, in the 1960s, mainly because of mistreatment by the police, discrimination, discrimination in housing or employment, uh, and they would bubble up and result in a lot of physical and economic harm to the cities that they were inflicted on. You have riots in Los Angeles in 1965, Detroit in 1967, Harlem in 1964, and then Newark in 1967. Now, when these rioting riots occurred, you start to see looting of businesses, you start to see assault, 
arson, a lot of property damage. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So in Los Angeles, you're looking at 34 deaths, 1,000 injuries, 3,000 arrests, and 45 million in damage. You could start to see the images there. In Detroit, 39 killed, 1,100 injuries, 7,000 arrests, $45 million in property damage. Harlem in 1964, one killed, 118 injuries, 465 arrests. Newark, 26 killed, 727 injuries, 1,400 arrests. So the effects of these riots, uh, the Civil Rights Act is passed in 1968, and we'll talk about that again later. But in that act, you start to see some penalties for people who are rioting. So number one, if you deprive people of their civil rights, there is an increased penalty. However, the section did not apply to acts on the part of law enforcement officers, National Guard, or members of the armed forces who are engaged in suppressing a riot or civil disturbances. So if you have uh, a riot of, of 5,000 people and 20,000 police officers are called in and you get hurt by a member of the armed services, um, the penalty does not apply to you. And this became a real um, point of contention for members of SNCC and members of the Black Panther Party. In addition, it provided five years in prison for anyone attempting to organize, promote, encourage, or participate in, or carry on a riot. So uh, this becomes an issue that the U.S. government really wants to address and prevent. Uh, by April of 1968, King is assassinated. Uh, he went to Memphis to support a strike among African-American sanitation workers. Now, at this point, there's a lot of controversy surrounding King's death. Uh, the FBI at this point had been, and for a long time, had been following um, Martin Luther King. They had wiretapped his phones. Um, they had spies. And there's a lot of controversy about his assassination because King was very careful about uh, his safety and the people who surrounded him were equally careful about his safety. And so whenever he went to participate in a movement, he always stayed in a hotel that had lobbies and hallways. He never would have stayed at a hotel like this. You see how it's incredibly open. However, um, the FBI uh, launched this campaign in Memphis uh, with in coordination with the media at the time saying that Martin Luther King was, was a member of the bourgeoisie. He had no connection with African-American sanitation workers and he was taking advantage of them and he was staying at the Hilton or the Hyatt. Uh, and King stayed in those places, again, for his safety in order to have security. So he was really criticized and eventually he decides, you know what, I'm gonna stay at a black owned business. Uh, this is really important to me. I'm going to stay at a Black-owned business, and it was not very safe for him. So he, he stays at this um, motel, and he is assassinated by a sniper as he stood on his hotel balcony. Uh, James Earl Ray pleaded guilty to King's murder, and he was sentenced to 99 years in prison. Shortly after he was, um, he pleaded guilty, he ends up recanting his confession. Now, the effects of King's assassination. Congress passes that Civil Rights Act of 1968 that I had mentioned, and President Johnson calls on Americans to reject the blind violence. And this is really key because when the nation heard about, the, about King's assassination, they wanted to have riots on the streets, and a lot of people were scared at that time what would happen to the movement. Uh, Congress and Johnson passed this legislation, uh, and a key part of this legislation is the Fa Fair Housing Act. So this addresses some of the economic concerns that members of the movement had. This outlaws discrimination based on race, color, national origin, or religion when buying, selling, or renting, or financing a house. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to talk about in this lecture is the 1968 Olympics. Uh, this is a really important part of the movement and again really illustrates how this movement changes. Um, 1968 is a very tense year which we'll talk about when we talk about uh, Johnson's um, domestic and, and foreign policy issues. So American track and field athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos took oops, 
took um, the stage uh, to receive their medals for um, winning in a track and field event, you can see that uh, their first and third place. And uh, these are two outspoken activists. They had a big problem with the Olympic Committee inviting uh, South Africa and South African athletes to participate in the Olympics because of the apartheid. They wanted to advocate for the hiring of black coaches. Uh, and when they won, they took this moment to to have an active protest in the middle of hearing um, the national the American national anthem because America took first place, uh, they had the black power symbol at that time with their heads down. Uh, this got them into a lot of trouble and this actually kicked them out of the Olympic Village and they weren't able to participate in the Olympics moving forward. However, Tommy Smith says it was a cry for freedom and for human rights. We had to be seen because we couldn't be heard. So hopefully you see that by 1968, the movement had become a lot more aggressive. SNCC is going to change their title to the Student National Courting Committee instead of the Student Nonviolent Courting Committee. King is assassinated. Uh, we become in America the in the thick of the Vietnam War, you're, you have a lot of uh, anti-war demonstrations. There's a, a huge tense moment. President Johnson is not going to run for re-election um, right before the 1968 Olympics and shortly after King's assassination, Bobby Kennedy is assassinated uh, while he is running for president on the Democratic ticket. In the summer of 1968, you also have massive riots in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention. It becomes a real tense time for America. And by the end of 1968, we're entering a real turning point. So that is it. Thank you for listening this whole time. Thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs>